No, no. It's the wrong, wrong button. That's uh, the wrong button. It's not very nice. So yeah, hopefully we got the homework. I guess the project five almost figured out. So there is now new homework number three, <coughs> which is gonna be more on the theory again. So like like previously, essentially like practice for your final. Similar idea as the midterm and homework number two. Uh, regarding the project number five, this this actually ties into it pretty closely. In the project number five, that was easy because it let the forces were just linear in your positions, which corresponds to quadratic energy. Because forces are derivative of energy, so if energy is quadratic, then the derivatives are linear, and the second derivatives would be constant. So that's the special case when the Hessian, the Hessian we talked about the last time of the function, would be constant. Because if you have something that on, that's only quadratic, then the second derivatives are constant, and I'm not changing with respect to x and y. So that's why that case is simple. Now when we will be doing real uh, or <laughs> more accurate physics-based models, we will not really have that. Like already when you start doing springs that can rotate, that's really the reason why the, 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 the bouncy spring was so simple to do because the springs could not rotate, only could go up and down. But if you have a spring in 2D or 3D, already in 2D, and it, and it can move, it can rotate, then you end up with an energy function F which is not quadratic, but you, and you can still deal with it, except that the Hessian will be changing. At every x and y, the Hessian matrix will be different. So I guess that's what we will be covering at physics-based animation. Okay, and before we talked about how can we understand the Hessian uh, using eigenvalues and eigenvectors, taking advantage of the fact that the Hessian is symmetric and positive semi-definite, which it is not. Yeah, it can be, it doesn't have to be, right? Then that, that we classify if it's, if it's like a convex function, concave function, or a settle point. That's what we talked about. And I finished by discussing skew symmetric matrices. Yeah, I was just gonna make the note that they are not that evil, that they actually have a very good meaning. Uh, let's take a look at a two by two skew symmetric matrix. Let me explain it here. So if I'm in R2, eh, how can all skew symmetric matrices look like? So I know that on a diagonal I have to have zeros, right? And here, well, it's gonna be really dumb, right? It's just minus A and A, where A is some number. So they really only have one degree of freedom, right? So I can as well write it that's arbitrary skew symmetric matrix in two dimensions. So I can also write it like this, right? So what, what is this transformation? We have been through that many times. <laughs> Let's see if we, get, if we can get it right this time. Well, no, permutation has to be binary, right? And here I have the minus thing. Uh, but it's something al almost like, almost, yeah. It's a rotation, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by, by what angle? <laughs> by... Um, by, by uh, let, let, me, let me write again the rotation matrix. 90, that's right. This is a general two by two rotation, right? So if it's 90, I get minus one here, one here, and 90, the cosine is zero. So that's, it, that's exactly what it is. So in 2D, skew symmetric matrices are 90 degrees rotations. Isn't that interesting? So what, <laughs> graphically, if I have a vector like this and I rotate it 90 degrees, then of course get this, and I can look at it, if it's like a free vector, I can like imagine that the vector starts here, right? So imagine I have like some, some object here, an object, and if I take like if I imagine these are vertices, so I have their coordinates. And if I do the 90 degree rotation of, of every vertex, I get something like this. 
does it ring some bell what 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 this what this could be and there is there is the parameter of a so i can make these small or make them big what this what this matrix essentially does is it takes the instantaneous velocity of a rotation motion with respect to axis with respect to the z axis oh isn't that cool <laughs> so if i rotate like this then I will have some instantaneous... So if, if I had an object that was rotating about the axis like this, and I wanted to compute its Im instantaneous immediate velocity, this is exactly how I would compute it. Right? Because if I, if, I, if I have some vector here, I just take 90 degrees rotation of that vector, and that's exactly... If, if it's rotating, then it's tracing circles, right? But but the tangent here is just the, this, th that's the direction of the tangent. And the, the magnitude means the speed of the rotating motion. If it's rotating really fast, then this A is gonna be huge. It's gonna be huge velocity. If it's rotating slowly, then it's gonna be small. Another way you can look at it is using what we, uh, we can ni nicely tie together. Before we were talking about ordinary differential equations, I guess that's also what you were solving for your homework. So if I write this, oh, just a 2D, oops, this is one, 2D ODE, where here Y is a function of time going to R2. Hey. <laughs> <coughs> then, then what is the solution of this ordinary differential equation? So first of all, intuitively, what am I doing? I'm saying that the time derivative of y is going to be this, which is just the 90 degrees rotation time scaling of a. So if you remember the analog of if I the analog of like dropping like a boat in a river, that means I drop something in the velocity field. So the velocity field is going to look like this, right? Just going to be this. For for any vector, I just take its 90 degrees rotation. So the velocity field is really like a swir swirl like this, right? So if I drop a point somewhere, what will be the solution? If I drop it into this flow, what curve it's going to trace? Shouldn't be too difficult to guess if I did a good job explaining it. Yeah? Yes, exactly, it will tra trace a perfect circle. And the way we can tie it to linear algebra is that we know that the solution of this ODE is can be exp or you know what let me call this theta because it's going to be the angle. Oh uh, no, sorry, making a mess. This is a, and what I want to do is to take the exponential of a zero minus one one zero times theta. We know that the solution oh no. Okay, we, we need to close the door. <laughs> Thanks. I need to concentrate on this. So if this is my initial condition sorry. No, don't okay I'll write it again. Zero minus one one zero theta and here is just y zero. So this is my initial condition and this is this is how the solution looks like in time theta so all i need to do is compute the exponential of this matrix really just like you were doing for the homework so the exponential of matrix a theta times zero minus one one zero and guess what's going to be going to be exactly this so this is this is the solution i mean after putting there some some initial conditions so uh, the point I wanted to make here is that the skew symmetric matrices, not only that they are evil, they are they are generators of rotations, which is probably better intuition than like the evil <laughs> counterpart of symmetric matrices. 
they are like instantaneous rotations, which really means angle velocity, uh, which means the instantaneous velocity of rotational motion. Again, this was something. This is something that will come up in simulation of rigid bodies. When they have, when they rigid bodies in space can be moving with translation, right? And so they have some linear velocity, and they can be also rotating. So that they mean that they have some angular velocity, and so the instantaneous velocity can be exactly represented by a skew symmetric matrix. How would a skew symmetric matrix look like in 3D in general? Or how many degrees of freedom would it have? A, B, C, minus A, minus B, minus C. So that's three degrees of freedom, right? And this is exactly the axis of rotation. But yeah, we will. Uh, this is this is probably better to leave for later. For physics. So the next thing I wanted to discuss is another application of symmetric matrices, and has to do optimizing a quadratic form. It's actually interesting that as I keep talking about simulating physics, physics simulation is can be also understood as optimizing some a function in the simplest case is quadratic in more realistic cases it's not quadratic uh, anyway let me stop rambling and let's 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 look at that so let's say that we want to minimize a quadratic function just just a real just a single variable function from the real line to the real line so how we can do it is by turning it into this for into this form which which immediately exposes where where the minimum is right so why why this is the same so the, if i look at the first term and i just write it out i will see that it's ax squared plus a times 2 bx divided by a divided by 2a and plus a b squared divided by actually i can just write b divided by 2a squared right so i took the first term and wrote it out so here the twos cancel and the a cancel so this is just this is just bx and this is a b, b divided by 2a squared so if I want to just rewrite, if I want this to be equal, then I have the ax squared here is the same, the bx is the same, and all, all I need to do is add back c and subtract the term that I added there, right? So this this is this is this is really the same thing. It's just algebraic manipulation of that thing, right? And from here, it's it's obvious what is what is the extremum of the function. Obviously, the extremum is just minus b divided by two a, right? because that's that's where the function is now centered and it's easy to tell when it's a minimum and when it's a maximum right because if, if a is positive then the then the parabola looks like this then it's then it's convex function and if it's negative it's it's shaped the other way around so in this case it's maximum in this case it's minimum make sense so this is this is the 1D case, and the interesting th thing is that if we have a general quadratic form, the general really refers to the fact that here I have also linear term and constant term. The constant term, of course, does not matter as as, as long as we are just minimizing, e extremizing this thing because that's just a constant shift up or down. Does it doesn't change the extrema at all, right? The linear term does. So if we want to compute the extremum extrema of a general quadratic form we can do a similar trick we can uh, rewrite it in exact it, this, this is the exact same idea so we rewrite it like this so uh, let's uh, take a look if this really is the same thing so if i write it out so i will expand this thing and what i will get here is x d a x plus one half a inverse oh okay maybe i should do b transpose a inverse transpose ax right 
plus another one half. So this was this term times x. That's gonna be the x t a and one half a inverse b. We know that we assume that a is symmetric, right? We have been proved that we have, when you have quadratic forms, you can just assume it's symmetric. And the last term is just this, a inverse b transpose a, and again, one half a inverse b. So all I did, I just expanded using distributed with a, this, this, this term here. So what are these two guys? So this falls out, this is just identity. So what I have there is just one half BTX plus one half XTB. This is just a dot product, right? So this is, this is equal just to BTX or XTB, they are the same, right? If, if, if you disagree, then just tell me and I will explain it better. So does the same thing happen as in the 1D case? Here, here this term corresponds to this term. Here the, the mixed terms, they are just the BTX. And here I just need to add back C and subtract the, this, this guy here, the, this one that like appeared there as a byproduct. So I just subtract it here because it doesn't depend on X. This is just a constant, right? So this is, so after, after, I, after I add back this, I, I, I see that this is really equivalent to that. Right, and here uh, I guess you could also look at it as like a change of variables. If I like defined y equals x plus one half a inverse b, then this is just y t a y plus some some funny constant, right? Th this entire thing is is, a, is nothing but a constant. Mm -hmm. So as long as we are just ex finding extrema, finding minimum or maximum or critical points, the constant does not matter. The constant only shifts the entire function up or down. It doesn't change the extrema, right? So this this doesn't matter at all. It doesn't doesn't appear in the in the final formula. And from 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 this uh, expression, you see that with, with with the y variable, this is just a quadratic form. And therefore the ext extremum is exactly at y equals zero. In, in, in other words, x equal minus one half a inverse b. So that's the critical point. And what type of critical point it is, is determined by which type of the quad of quadratic form a is. So it's, you can again nicely relate it to the 1D case. Here, here the quadratic, this is just an example of 1D quadratic form. In 1D, it's either hyperbola like this, a convex one or a concave one. You cannot have a settled case in 1D, right? You have to go to 2D, so you have a settled case. So that's how the, two, how, how the 1D case is simpler. But once you go already to 2D, then it can happen that a can also be indefinite, which means that that's not an not an, not um, extremum, but it's a settle point, right? I, I think I was showing the settle points on a picture before. This is like a nice example of a settle point, right? Mm -hmm. In one direction it's convex, in the other direction it's concave. So this is not, not an extremum, right? If I go in one direction, I'm getting higher values. If I go in an another direction, I'm getting lower values. This is neither minimum nor maximum. So that, that I can tell by uh, determining that A is indefinite. And if A is positive definite, then it's equivalent to the case of this A being positive. So I have a convex function and I found what? Minimum, right? If it's the other way around, if th that corresponds to the case of A being negative and A is here is negative definite, then I found a maximum. By the way, this is, this is really, this, this is something that might be useful to remember. Essentially, these, these notions of positive definiteness, negative definiteness, and positive semi-definite, negative semi-definite, those are just matrix generalizations of saying positive number, non-negative number, negative number, and non-negative number. 
right? I guess I could. This is this is actually cool. The, the analog, so I will. So I will write it here. Sort of like this. If a is just a number, it's sort of equal or sort of analogous to saying that the matrix is positive definite. If A is negative, then it's sort of like saying A is negative definite. If A is greater or equal than zero, then it's something analogous to saying it's positive semi definite. And this is exactly analogous negative semi definite. Okay. <coughs> So uh, now we know how to optimize a general quadratic function. We can tie it back to what we were uh, discussing before about least squares, right? Let's let's quickly remember what was going on in least squares. I need another paper. So let's let's remember first the geometric picture of least squares. So the easiest one was like a fitting a line in two D, right? So if I had some points and so on up to like xn and they had they had some values something like this so this was like y1 this was y2 this was y3 this y n well, some 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 other points here so the y1 means it's, it's in this height y2 is here and so on so then if i wanted to find a least squares fitting line it means this then i know that the line has the form of uh, sorry a t plus b where a is the slope and b is the the intercept I, think, I guess that's the, the terminology and I want to minimize this vertical difference from the line right so I can write it in matrix form I'll just do it quicker than before because here it's just recapitulating essentially what we already had previously. And here I would like to write equal y1, y2, and so on to yn. But you know that it's really unlikely that I could have their perfect equality. So I like say just like a, as close as possible to this, right? So this is this is just saying that I'm looking for a and b such that when I when I compute the value on the function, then I get something that's not too far from the y, uh, y on the input, right? So this can be written in matrix form as this. So the problem really is to find x that minimizes this function. Oh, because it's here. Okay. You remember this, right? This was just 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 the standard least squares. So we are, I can write it as an optimization problem, and I can just apply what we what we just said about optimizing a quadratic function to solve this optimization problem. So uh, I can take this and rewrite it. So this is just. So the square norm is just a dot product of that thing with itself, right? So this, if I transpose that thing, I get x t a t minus b t, and then I use distributivity, so I get x t a t a x minus x t a t b minus b t a a x plus b transpose b. So this is just a general quadratic form where the where the matrix here is a t a. Here the linear term is minus two b t a. And this is this is just a constant that doesn't really matter. Yeah, this this is this is just like what we have been through many times already. Is is it clear where this this comes? Is how this how I aggregated these two terms? Why this is true? It's because this is just a scalar, right? This is like what is going on here. This is like a row vector. This is a matrix. And this is a column vector. So 
So if I multiply this thing together, I get just a scalar and scalar transposed is the same thing, right? So I can easily transpose that and I, have, and I haven't changed anything. I can still write equality there. So this is how I make the, this term to be equal to this term so I can then group them together and get the two there. Yep. So this is, I, I just rewrote the objective and we know we need to solve the optimization promise to minimize it with respect to X. So, and how, how to minimize that? This is, this is what we just discussed, right? So for a general quadratic form, the, the minimum is minus one half A inverse B, right? So if we, if we do that, we have minus one half, then we take the ATA inverse, let's hope it exists. We will discuss that in a little bit. If it doesn't exist, we cannot really do it, right? And then B, this is like a row vector, so this is 2ATB, right? And I'm missing minus some, oh yeah, that, that was minus from the B, so this, this minus is cancel, this cancels, and what I'm left with is just the standard normal equations we discussed before. So this is another way how you can derive the normal equations. That's, that's the optimization approach to least squares. It, it, it leads to the same result. Before, originally, we were deriving it from the condition of orthogonality, but you can also derive it, I guess, in the calculus way by minimizing a quadratic function. This thing, I believe, is uh, one of the uh, examples in your homework number three. That's due next Friday. It's to show that uh, this thing. So first of all, that ATA is positive definite. Well, ATA always is at least positive semi-definite. I think we have done that previously. If not, it's also very, very easy to show. And it's positive definite if A has full column rank. Because then if A has full column rank, then this is positive definite. That means that zero cannot be an eigenvalue which means that the matrix cannot be singular, and that means I can, I can invert it, right? Let's think about it graphically. What could go wrong here in, in, this, in this line fitting example? Why, when I would not be able to invert this, this, the ATA coming from this? So when this matrix would not have full column rank? So that would have to be the case that the, that the first column is the same as the second column, right? For example, if I had this, then clearly I don't have full column rank. And my column, my, the, my column rank is just one, the dimension of the column s subspace. Or, or this could be like five or, or whatever, right? It would be just, just a multiple of the second column that that corresponds to what that corresponds to all these axes being lumped at one single point right and even if i have million points but they have all the same x they could have like different y's that doesn't matter but if they have the same x i cannot find a unique fit right there is many many possible lines that fit it equally well so that, that's what it means, that I cannot take the inverse of it, that the least square solution is not uniquely defined. On this example, it's fairly clear, I think. Is it? <laughs> yeah, this, this really means that all the points, all the axes ended up lumped at one point. So then clearly I don't have a unique solution. Okay, here's another optimization example. This is sort of like applied optimization or operations research type of thing, if you will. Optimization is like very important, right? Because sometimes you might be optimizing money and that's exactly the case of this, this example. So here, like assume you are in a, in a company that sells burgers, sodas and fries, like an optimization example. And here, like you observe via some statistics or you, you hired some statisticians and they told you that the, the volume, the number of sold items in millions of units or whatever depends on price in, in, in this relationship. 
So this is the price elasticity matrix. So that means that if you increase the price, then you are going to sell less because people are going to buy less, uh, less of it, right? It sort of makes sense. Also, there is some cost you pay for producing each of these items. It's just a dollar, a dollar amount. And what you want to do if you are an owner or CEO of that company, of course, is to maximize your profits, right? And in the simple case, it just turns, boils down again to quadratic optimization. So let's take a look at it. So, <clears throat> So what was the P? P was the price of every item, right? So that, that's the money I get. And the C is I have to pay for them to produce them. So this is my pure revenue per item. And this thing is the, is the number of items I sell, right? So if I do the dot product, this is my total revenue, right? This has like three components. Each, each component is one of one of the items, burgers, soda, fries. And here, so here, here is my revenue on each of the items. How much do I make money on every single item sold? And this is the number of items I sold, right? So the balancing I'm, I'm doing here is, of course, if I increase the price, then I will be making more money on every single item, but then I will be selling less of them because due to the price elasticity matrix, people will buy less of them, right? So I want to find a sweet spot <laughs> where I'm making most, most money, sell, not necessarily selling most things, but when I'm selling just enough things to make the biggest profit. And it turns out this is just another example of quadratic optimization example, uh, quadratic optimization problem. So if I write this out, this is just a dot product, right? So here I get the P minus P T E P, that's, that's this term. Then this, this guy gets me minus CT, EP, with minus here, so the main minus is cancel here. This is PTV0, and here is plus, wait a second, is that correct? This is minus CTV0, yeah, I have to have four terms here. <clears throat> and if you look at it carefully, you notice that this is, <clears throat> what I'm looking for is the P. C is fixed. That's the price I have to pay for my item. So I cannot really like choose there. Only thing what I can choose is the price tag I'm selling my burgers for. Right? That's 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 the P. So this is this is the optimization variable. The others are everything else is given. The price elasticity is how my consumers behave. I cannot I cannot maybe I could influence it by marketing or something, but let, we are not modeling that. <laughs> so uh this matrix E was not symmetric, but we know that we can just symmetrize it, right? Because as long as the quadratic form is concerned, it doesn't matter if there is E or one half of E plus ET. So this is how I turn it to symmetric matrix. And then the linear term was P ETC plus V zero, right? I just transposed this pt this this entire thing so i can just say uh, wait a second i think i did it the other way round this should have been really cte plus b0 b0 transpose times p where p is my unknown uh -huh. And this is this is this is the B transposed. So the B untransposed. I just transpose this entire thing. So this will be etc plus v zero. So no, nothing really interesting is happening here. I'm just essentially converting it to the canonical example of a quadratic of a general quadratic form with the linear term and with the constant term. Here is some constant term. Here the constant term actually sort of matters. It doesn't matter in in fixing the prices in in the, how shall I pick the, the, my price tags? But it does matter, of course, if I want to evaluate the total revenue, then this is then the, then the constant term matters quite a lot, right? It will just tell you if make <laughs> it will just add or subtract from your uh, revenue. And once we have done that, once we have figured out the the general form, then we can just apply the previous formula, which is minus one half of a inverse b 
and this is the optimal solution. This is my sweet spot. How shall I pick my price tags? Okay, and final and most interesting example, I guess also related to optimization, then we'll be done with symmetric matrices, at least, or at least with this chapter. And there is some more to it in regards to SVD, but we'll be done with this part. So uh, when I was talking about the least squares fit, you might have told me, hey, isn't this a little bit dumb to be like fitting the line to the points like this? Shouldn't I really, like if I have, if I have some points in 2D, shouldn't I want the line which is closest to all the points? And for how I measure closeness, right? If I have points, I should measure the distance of a point from a line by orthogonal projection, right? Not by some vertical projection, which is really arbitrary, but by really picking the line which is closest to all the points, right? That, 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 that would make more sense. That's exactly what total least squares is about. So the, the problem looks like this. I am in plane in this case, it, it wouldn't have to be a plane, but it's easier to explain on a plane. And I have a bunch of points on the plane and I want to find the line that really minimizes the distance, the sum of distances from all the points. Okay, so do you, do you see the difference from these squares? In these squares I was looking at these, at these vertical distances, which are not really as, as, as nicely geometrically motivated, right? Turns out that this is a slightly harder problem, yet with symmetric matrices we can still solve it, which is, which is cool. So what I'm really looking for here is I'm looking for the line, but I can equivalently be looking for its normal vector, right? And I say that's a unit normal vector u. This, this was this, this, this little funny hat is for, it says that the u is unit. Because then if u is unit, then I can measure this length simply using dot product. So if I if I have these these vectors, those are those are those are my input vectors, then taking a dot product of this, so those are like this is like p1, this is like p2, and so on for the other ones. So then the dot product of u times my pi is just this length, right? Because u is unit. And that's what I want to minimize. I, I call this the error. So this this distance here is the error. And I sum the error for all the all my input data, and I realize that the error is actually nothing but a dot product of the input datum pi, or input vector, and the unknown unit vector u had, had I'm solving for. So this u really is is the unknown here. That's 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 the normal of my best fit line. I don't I don't know yet like which way it should be oriented. But I know that the optimal one will be minimizing this function. It's important that the u hat is unit. If I relax that u hat, u hat is unit, if I said that u, u can be anything, what would be the solution of this? It would have a trivial solution. The solution would be just, just pick u0, right? This is obviously non-negative. Right, I can never get a negative number there. So the minimum at best will be at zero, right? So if I allowed arbitrary length of u, I could just pick u zero, I would, I would have a trivial optimum. So that's why I have to put the constraint there that really, let me, rem let me put it explicitly here, that the length of u hat is one. So how do we solve this? We solve it by first rewriting it So this is this is what I ended with. So this is this is what I need to uh, optimize. So this is just a scalar multiple of two numbers, right? And I can also write it from matrix vector multiplication associativity like this, right? Because those are really vectors, and I'm I'm multiplying. This. I can like interpret this multiplying one by one matrices. And I can just, from associativity, I can just change the uh, brackets. So what I get here is the outer product of pi with pi t. And then I can further take the sum inside and essentially get the u 
completely outside of the sum. So what happened here, here is some matrix. This will be like an N by N matrix. And this, this can, this, this will start, this should start looking familiar because this is then a quadratic form. What I'm minimizing here will be a quadratic form. The problem here is that I'm minimizing its subject. Again, let me write it here again to be super clear that the length of U is one. That's what makes it really complicated because this is a non-convex constraint, right? This is saying, in 2D, this is saying that the U hat has to be on a unit circle, right? So that's clearly, it's not, not a convex set. If I have two points here in the middle, I'm not on the circle, not even remotely, right? There are some good things though. This matrix is symmetric. Obviously, if I transpose this, I get the same thing. And we can also see relatively easily that it's positive semi-definite. Okay, this might be part of the homework. I'm not sure. Well, let's let's see how do we how how do we prove that A is positive semi-definite? We can prove it by looking at this x t a x, which is nothing but the sum of x t p i p i t x, which is again nothing but p i t x squared, and this this definitely cannot be negative, right? So x t a x has to be non-negative, which implies that a is positive semi-definite at least right could also be positive definite if i if i was lucky okay and then the task is to minimize this quadratic form now we now we know it's positive definite symmetric uh, sorry positive definite quadratic form subject to this constraint right because I know it's a real symmetric matrix, I can I can invoke the spectral theorem and write A equivalently as this. And then I can introduce the substitution. Then I say that this is my B hat thing. So I'm still optimizing this with respect to unit U. So that means in, in, the, in the new variables, I am really optimizing just this, right? In, in two by two, the lambda is a diagonal matrix, right? Lambda is lambda one, zero, zero, lambda two. And V is a vector, so V hat is, has components V hat one, V hat two. So this is the function I'm minimizing subject to this constraint. It turns out that because Q is an orthonormal matrix, could even be chosen to be a rotation, doesn't matter in this case. The length of V hat is the same of length of U hat. I think this is one of your homework problems too. It's, it's pretty, pretty easy to, to do that. So it means that this, this constraint, the U hat equal one, can, the length of U hat equal one is equivalent to length of V hat equal one, okay? So all I'm really doing, I'm optimizing this subject to this constraint. And that is very simple to do because all I need to do there is I can write the constraint like this. So B hat squared is one minus one hat squared. And then I just plug it, plug it back in. So I will get lambda one V one hat squared plus lambda two one minus V one hat squared. And that is lambda one minus lambda two v one at squared plus lambda two, right? And uh, let's assume that the lambda one, uh, the order doesn't matter, right? So I can I can just assume whatever order of the eigenvalues I want. So I assume that the lambda one is the smaller one. So in this case, this becomes a negative. Yeah, because this is the smaller, this is the bigger. So this is less than zero. And my v1 squared has to be from interval zero to one, right? So clearly the minimum is v1 squared being one and v2 squared being zero. 
that's that's the optimal and that really corresponds to so b1 squared being one if i go back to the substitution that exactly corresponds to taking the eigenvector of a corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue that's the solution so the solution of the total least squares problem is to form this matrix and then find the eigenvector corresponding to the smallest eigenvalue similarly if you wanted to maximize it so if i didn't want if i wanted a direction that makes it not smallest but biggest so it would be the other direction the orthogonal direction this one then this would be another very famous problem called principal component analysis and we will discuss that in more detail in the upcoming lectures but it's really it's really exactly the same idea except they're looking for maximum as opposed to minimum okay okay so i'm already late so but that's that's good because that is it do you have any questions on that Okay, so I guess I'll see you on Monday. Good luck with your homework. <laughs>